before going through all those like complexities, I really want to explore. I know some of your story, you know, because you you grew up in Glasgow, Nori. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about your earliest memories. Yeah, I was I was, I was born in Glasgow, um, which is a very different Glasgow from it is now. I mean, now Glasgow is quite quite cool. It's it's quite quite an edgy place, but. Uh, when I was brought in Glasgow, it was still an industrial city, uh, dark, grim, grey, big high tenements, um, not much, not much sunshine, <laughs> uh, and a bit dark and grey in terms of society and attitudes as well. You know, it was, it, it's um, it's uh, quite a quite a it was quite a, a kind of narrow, restrictive place in a lot mm. of ways much more so than it is now. But uh, I was born in Govan Hill in a typical Glasgow tenement, um, which I think is still there. Uh, and uh, like a lot of people of my generation, you get, you're born in a tenement and then you move to a council flat a bit further out. So I was brought up in a council flat in, in uh, for those that would know Glasgow, just between Oakshaws and, and uh, Thornley Bank. And uh, I went to school there and then went to a secondary school in Shawlands, which is, is one of the bigger suburbs in the, the south side of Glasgow. And uh, that was really the 1960s uh, when I was, as I say, Glasgow then wasn't as it is now. I was desperate to leave. Uh, never wanted to go back for years after I, mm -hmm. after I had left and restricted my visits to just seeing my parents uh, a couple of times a year. Um, and my way out was to, to go away to university. I actually went to, to university in Northern Ireland uh, as much by accident as anything else. But uh, that to me was opened up a whole new world, opened up a whole new world socially. And, uh, you know, a, a new understanding of a, a, a new different type of, of society we are doing things as far as anybody from the outside ever understands Northern Ireland, which is a kind of different story. But uh, also the, the, the new world of being at a university and uh, all of that in terms of, of um, broadening horizons, meeting sorts of people you would never have met before during what, as I say, was a fairly restricted kind of working class mm. opera in Glasgow. Mm. Uh, so that was Glasgow. I mean, I, I actually feel a lot better about it now than I did when I was forced to live there, you know. Mm. But as I say, it's Glasgow that's changed, I think, rather than me. So. Mm -hmm. Like one of the questions I always ask that, I mean, how did you find your parents, you know, shape your understanding about things, you know? Quite a lot. Um, and I think as you get older, you realise uh, that uh, their influence on you has been a lot, uh, a lot um, greater than you ever believed it would be. You know, you find yourself half turning into your parents, I'm sure you find the same with the girls, you said that you, you find yourself saying things and oh God, that could be my father that just said that, you know. Uh, but um, my father was, uh, I suppose you, you'd call him an old socialist, he, was, he, was, he wasn't much of an activist in, in later life, he liked, he liked the idea of being a sort of left-wing firebrand, but I think I don't know how much of it he'd actually got involved in when he was younger, but he was always associated with uh, sort of left-wing issues, left-wing causes. He had been originally in what was called the Independent Labour Party, which was a kind of... There was a split in the Labour Party in the 1930s, and uh, the Independent Labour Party maintain a more socialist position and things, but eventually it's, they all came together again. Um, but he always identified with the ILP, the Independent Labour Party. Um, so that was, that 
was that was an influence. My, my mother's side of the family, they were they were actually much more working class, and they, they were all shipyard workers and, and heavy engineering and the rest of it. Uh, but uh, less political, oddly enough, you know, they, they, they weren't they weren't uh, they weren't a typical trade union type uh, Glasgow working class people at all. So, yeah, as I said, as I said, though, these influences you you, you, you realise are stronger than you thought you were. You know, and the older you get, I think, the more the more you you, you uh, come to terms with the fact that you've you haven't you haven't quite turned all the new pages you thought you had in, in terms of in terms of your life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, did you have any like fast political memory of like you know going to a protest or with your dad, you know, or like having a discussion with him in the dinner? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the word, there was, I mean, I can remember as a very small child, it was the, the, the big event in, in Glasgow uh, was the, the May Day March. And, and when I was a kid, it, it always started, started in George Square in town centre and uh, marched to Queen's Park in the south side. Uh, distance a couple of miles or so but uh, every year without fail we would uh, we would uh, go to that and, and these are some of my earliest memories of school was that you always stood and watched the, the procession come by and it was uh, it was a big big thing in these days it was uh, the pipe bands you know trade unions of the pipe bands uh, big factories of the pipe bands and the brass bands and uh, it was Labour Party, it was Communist Party, it was Trotskyist groups, and for years uh, it, it kind of died out in the 1960s, but for years I always remember the, the biggest cheer was for the veterans of the International Brigades from the Spanish Civil War, who would march as, as part of the May Day thing, you know, obviously time took its toll, but uh, that was always a, a, a big feature. And the floats, the, the lorry floats from the old um, socialist Sunday school system, which used to exist. It was an alternative to religious Sunday schools. And so you had a sort of party socialist Sunday school and a government socialist Sunday school, and you always get dressed up and had a big lorry float. Uh, so these were big events, and you always had uh, somebody who would lead the march, who would be a a big figure from from uh, from left wing politics. Uh, one I remember was reminiscing about it quite recently. Was I guess it would have been around about 1960, but the march was led by Paul Robeson, the mm. great American singer actor, uh, early civil rights activist, and the rest. Now that was memorable. Queen's Park was absolutely you can move in it, you know. Uh, I, I remember as quite a bit, uh, quite a, a vivid memory that he was on the platform, the bandstand, doing his speeches and did a couple of songs and rest and all finished. And he was trying to kind of get away, but the crowd was all around him and wound go. And eventually he was more or less kind of trapped and abducted that they wouldn't let him go until he sang another couple of songs. And the best thing they could do was. They got, I know one of these old loudspeaker vans, we got the old kind of metal horn loudspeakers in the roof, and he had to stand there with a the microphone in the middle of Queen's Park, just belting out his songs, you know, for four people to let me go. But it was a great, these were great occasions, you know, and that, that obviously uh, I'm not even sure that, that, that the May Day March exists anymore in Glasgow, but they uh, were great occasions. Mm -hmm. But then later on, I get, initially I got involved in the peace movement, uh, the old CND, and uh, started going to my own marches, if you like, you know, Fast Lane and uh, the nuclear marches uh, of the 60s. And I sort of flirted with what was at the time, it was a reasonable... Uh, political movement in Glasgow, and that was the old anarchist movement. Uh, 
Uh, which again is uh, through, it's different from anarch the anarchist movement now. It was much more bedded in anarchist theory in that nineteenth century anarchist theory and sort of inspiration again from the Spanish Civil War, from the, the, the anarchist movement, the FBI and CNT in the Spanish Civil War. Um, and then eventually I found my way into the Labour Party, uh, almost sort of inevitably. And uh, initially in the Young Socialists, and, and unbeknown to me when I got involved in it, the Young Socialists at that time in the 1960s was very heavily influenced by militant tendency, which was sort of the, the Trotskyist, uh, Trotskyist movement within the Labour Party, which people would know about because of the great confrontations with Neil Kinnock and the rest of it. Um, and then that got interrupted by making it off to university in Northern Ireland, as I say, which of course was a whole different political world, a whole, a whole new history to learn, a whole new sort of way of, of looking at politics and, and the role of politics in society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, in terms of your going to schools, like the earliest memories, like, especially in the like secondary school, did you find any, any politics there as well? With the teachers teaching, you know, like history or modern studies? No, I'd, I'd love to say that I could, I could look back and, and remember teachers that were a fabulous influence in my life and the rest. I, I'm hard put in all honesty to do that, you know? Mm. I, I remember. Secondary school teachers at that time as being a bit obsessed with their own respectability, you know, and the, the fact that they were secondary school teachers and they'd come in with their copies of the Glasgow Herald under their arm, and that was a sort of marker of their middle class <laughs> respectability, you know. Um, we had a history teacher who I subsequently uh, realized or found out had, had been a bit of a, had been a collector of Marxist memorability and, and mem memorabilia and uh, sort of first editions of key radical left-wing texts. But honestly, at the time he was teaching, as you wouldn't have known, he was the most boring man imaginable. <laughs> it was a, a kind of cognitive dissonance later. You know, I thought, this, this, this guy should have been really good, but God, it was awful. You know, it's just, yeah. again, this sort of long, boring, do the minimum type of uh, type of approach to teaching, and that's that's what I remember. As I said, I'd love to join in with, a, with a, everybody celebrating their great inspiration of teachers. But I don't <laughs> know, quite honestly, that's, that's okay. I mean, like my memory is like when I was in a school. One of my one of my favorite thing things to do is like playing football. So it's like you know. It's a big thing playing football, you know, after school, stayed there and like come back, like came back at home, like very late. And the parents were really unhappy about those things, but we were happy. Did you have any of those, you know, other things, you know, like sports or anything you were involved or? or well, I, I, music? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, your school was your, your social life, it was your social, your social circle, and uh, that's, that, that's, I mean, I'm still in touch with people that was at, at secondary school with, you know, Facebook contacts and the rest. Uh, many of them who, who I only kind of rediscovered when you get a, a friend request over the past few years, you know, but it's, it's as if there's a, a, a new coming together. So, yeah, it was your social, your social circle, uh, very much so. Um, interesting thing, I mean, connecting up with uh, what we were talking about earlier is how many of these old chums from school who I would never have imagined at the time, but have turned out to be extremely left-wing radical people, you know. Uh, maybe I was just a wee bit ahead of the curve in, in getting into that when, when I was younger, you know, but mm. uh, an awful lot of, most of them, you know, are, are really, really good, interesting people uh, in their mm. political thinking, the rest. And you don't hear or see of them for 30 or 40 years, and then suddenly you're, you're 
reconnect and increase mm. and, mm. and uh, putting things together with them again. Uh, but in terms of, I mean, I, I did athletics quite a lot. That was that, that was my thing. I was never really into football. It was, I don't know. I know. I just never seemed to have the gene for it. My father was a great football fan, a very big football fan. But uh, maybe that's what put me off. I don't know. I just never really get into into it. But I, but I did enjoy running. I did enjoy mm. uh, mm. sports. Yeah. Mm. It was like, I mean, I think growing up in Glasgow is very political itself, isn't it? It's lots of things going on historically and also these like two football clubs as well. Um, I mean, how much you like, I mean, do you understand that that kind of things? I mean, I, I, I really don't understand, you know, why, you know, this kind of like emotional rivalry and all those things. Oh, I, I don't I, I, I don't understand how it lasted as long as it has. I mean, I, I, would have, I would have said 30 or 40 years ago, I thought, well, this is just something that's dying out, you know, but it hasn't. It's, it's, as, bad, it's as bad as it ever was. I mean, the origins of it are quite straightforward. It was the, the um, migratory movement of people from Ireland, particularly in the 19th century, economic migration into the west of Scotland from rural areas of Ireland to to a place where there was there was lots of work in the new industries and the rest of it. And of course, the, the Scots that were there already, as in many of these situations, had to sort of snatch for the bit of superiority they felt they had, you know, and the, that, that came down really to religion because by and large, of course, the, the Irish people coming over were Catholics and, and the, 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 the Scots had already been there hesitate to use the term native Scots because we're all native Scots, but uh, the, the Scots that were there already were predominantly Presbyterian Church of Scotland. And so that's that's where the division came from. It's really a social division, but uh, it, it took on these um, these uh, uh, kind of re religious aspect. And of course that finds its way into football because football was the, the big working class pastime activity. Um, now, I, I was never really exposed to it in, in a very uh, raw way at home because, as I say, our father was, was a man of the left. He, he would have nothing to do with it. And, and in fact, that even expressed itself in his, uh, his attitude to football. He was big in football. That was, that was his big thing he used to used to love going to matches and used to write letters to the paper about the rest, but he would never support Rangers or Celtic. Well, he'd obviously never support Celtic because he wasn't a Catholic. He was a Protestant, but he would never be a Rangers supporter. He was insistent in supporting one of the local teams in the south side of Glasgow, Third Lanark, uh, which no longer exists, hasn't existed since the 19. 60s of no business in the 1960s and after that he was homeless as far as football was concerned still very keen on football but there's no way he's going to migrate to become a ranger supporter you know at all was, uh, because that was a political thing you know yeah. Uh, but yeah it was all pervasive but as i say personally i was never exposed to the kind of um the, the, the kind of visceral sectarianism. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, my other memory is that of, of that time in, in, in Glasgow is that, uh, as I said, where we lived um, was between two traditional parts of Glasgow, older parts of Glasgow, Thornley Bank and Bolshaws, which had been mill areas. And there was a sectarian element to all that. And the Orange Lodge, the Protestant sectarian Orange Lodge uh, in Thornley Bank used to, once a year on the 12th of July, march down past where we lived to, to Pollock Shores, to the Orange Hall in Pollock Shores and the rest. And, and I can remember our next door neighbour across the veranda and the, the council flats flat across from us. Um, Mrs. Ramsey, she was she was a Catholic originally, the Irish from Donegal, 
and uh, my mother and her would stand in the common veranda, sort of laughing their heads off at the, 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 the kind of the, the orange walk and past, you know, and and uh, the the way people were dressed, and the rest of it, you know. So it was a, it, it was a very unsectarian upbringing that I had had, and it, it was only really through school and where I actually became aware of how, how edgy these things were, you know. Mm. I mean, the, the way I'm kind of like sensing you were growing up in Glasgow, but you were kind of an outsider in Glasgow as well. You've never been into the Glasgow, you know, this like Glasgow G and, you know, all those characteristics. It... Well, that, that's the sectarian side of it. As, as, as I say, Glasgow's an awful lot more than that because you've, you've got this uncomfortable kind of um, coexistence traditionally in Glasgow with, with the sectarian stuff on the one hand, but then of course you've got the Red Clydeside part of it as well, you know, the, the great radical tradition uh, of Glasgow, the great ILP people like Jimmy Maxton and the, the, the communist or communist oriented people like John McLean. Mm. Um, these are these are two completely different different parts. It's a it's a, it's a very schizophrenic city in a lot of ways, you know. A lot of a lot of things set together mm. um, quite strangely, you know. They coexist quite strangely. So I don't I don't I never really fell up on the outside. I was you know very much in in, in fault, I see. Mm. It maybe wasn't particularly academically oriented at school, but that was where your social life was, that's where your circle of friends was. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as I said, I was, I was very much involved in politics in Glasgow as a teenager before I got out. But I said that I wasn't sorry to get out and, and had no great desire to, to go back again, you know. It was, a, it was a kind of liberation in a lot of ways to, to, to be out of it. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, as a young man, when you went to like Northern Ireland, I mean, did you have other options to go somewhere else? No, no, no. <laughs> no. I, uh, I, I, see, I wasn't that academically inclined. And uh, in my, in my six year at school, I, I, I got quite ill. I was in hospital for a long time and uh, just didn't do at all well. In, in exams so when it came to it uh, you took what you were offered and what I was offered was this new university in Northern Ireland uh, and uh, I had to think think a lot about whether I was going to go because I thought at one stage that I'd maybe just you know find a job go to college part-time try and get some more hires and then go to university then but I thought no that's why do that when, when the opportunity is there? And it also got me out of Glasgow. <laughs> so that was that, that was that was one of these key decisions that you probably made without thinking too much about it that shapes the whole rest of your life, you know. Uh, so I, I decided to head off. But that was 1968, that was the autumn of 1968. And of course, the big civil rights movement in Northern Ireland was just getting underway then. That was when first big marches, marches were the big civil rights marches in Derry, uh, which I got involved with as a student. Uh, and then of course, 69, you had the, 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 the big trouble in the summer of 69 in Belfast and in Derry. The army comes in and trouble throughout 1970 and 1971 you've got the introduction of internment and it's just getting worse and worse and worse and worse you know um so i found so obsession identifying with a lot of the left-wing cause causes that were, were were tied up the civil rights movement but of course being a complete outsider as well and mm. a very steep learning curve about about a particular type of sectarian politics in Northern Ireland, of which mm. Glasgow was frankly a, a frail, pale imitation. You know. mm. so, so like, I mean, when you like look back those days, 
I mean, how risky it was to be there during that time? Not really. For me, it wasn't. Um, the, the, the university I was at was in, in Coraine, which is in the Northwest. And at that time, it was, it was still a relatively rural area. It was a, it was a kind of a farming town almost. You know, it was the, 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 the town where that provided services to what was predominantly an agricultural kind of um, community. Uh, it, it was a very strongly Protestant area, mm. that, that part of County Derry. Uh, but no, I mean, it, it never suffered anything like the, 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 the violence of, of Derry or Belfast or, or Newry or, or places, places closer to the border, you know. It had its fair share of trouble, but it tended to come a little bit later on. Mm. Uh, so he never, never really, never felt it personally at risk at all. Then again, at that age, you tend not to feel personally at risk regardless of what's going on mm. around about you, you know. Mm. Because like, like at the later part of your life, you became involved in international relations, you know, like more contemporary history stuff. So like, did that university play any role there in like molding some of your ideas about your future? Yeah, very much so. I mean, we were talking earlier about, um, about the influence of, of school teachers and the rest, and I was saying that unfortunately I can't, <laughs> you know, I can't join in with a, with a celebration of brilliant, inspirational teachers. But when I got to university, that, that changed. Um, I had uh, had a, a, a very influential mentor, uh, Bill Wallace, professor of history. When I went there, he was he was actually a Glasgow man himself. Uh, and uh, he was he was um, something that at, at, at the time was was relatively new. He was a contemporary historian. He was interested in post Second World War history. Now, back thirty four years ago, a lot of people didn't regard that as history. You know, that wasn't proper history. Proper history finished around about nineteen eighteen. Um, but he was very strong in, in, in looking at, at uh, contemporary international politics and in, in, as, a, as a genuine historical period. You know, it might only have been a month ago, but it's still part of a, of a historical continuum and it's got to be understood that way. And, and he, it was a new department, a new university, and he brought a lot of younger people with him who were his research students and, and very much reflected his ideas, you know, whether, whether it was to do with German history or Russian history or whatever. Um, so that was that, that, that was extremely influential. I mean, when I went to university, I originally wanted to do English. I didn't want to do history or politics or anything. It was very much into, into the literature side of things. And I had thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try and change to English um, when I'm there at the beginning. You can do that sort of thing. But within the first few weeks, I thought, no, this is, this is for me. I'm, I'm enjoying this. You know, this is, this, is, this is what I want to do. And that's and so on. Mm -hmm. um, because you did your PhD not in the same university, no. Like what no, you... it, yeah, I, I mean, I did, I did my degree, a history degree at, um, at uh, 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 Coraine, but I then went to the LSE to do a master's degree, a master of science degree in international relations. Uh, and then after I'd done that, I actually went back then to Ireland to do a PhD, it was a DPhil, they called it a doctor mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. um, All of which was only possible, of course, because it was a completely different world in terms of, um, in terms of financial support and opportunities. And 
had a grant to go to university in the first place. Couldn't have done it otherwise. I uh, had a full um, scholarship and uh, maintenance grant to do the master's degree. And then I had three years of, of maintenance grant and fees and the rest paid uh, to do to do the doctorate. I mean, these, these sort of things that were just, mm -hmm. it was common enough at the time, but uh, certainly it would be regarded as, as unbelievable, I'm sure, to mm -hmm. today's generation of students. You mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. No, that, that's one of the things, you know, like lots of the students are put off by you know, the amount of money they have to spend just to, to get a degree. Um, and I saw like over the years, lots of really, really amazing students could not do further studies because, you know, they just could not afford it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. ended up with like very, very small time job, you know, administrator or, and that really, you know, breaks my heart. And then, you know, your stories and the other, other senior colleagues, the similar stories and you know, how the state took care of those things. I mean, mm -hmm. they're one of those things, you know, these are good things to do for the society because these people will actually build the society. And now the state or whatever the state is totally detached from this and just like throw things, you know, it's a like mm -hmm. squid game, you know, let's see yeah. who wins. No, I mean, I often people joke about baby boomers and the rest, but it's mostly an American context, but in the British context, I think anyone that was born within 15 years of the Second World War, um, they were born in, so it was hardly utopia, but the, 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 the way the state worked, the way communities worked was, was entirely different, you know, that we were born into the first bold kind of phase of the National Health Service, for example, um, it was kind of expected that uh, that you would stay on at school beyond the leaving age, which was never, never something that was expected in, in working class areas before that. Uh, if you stayed on at school and you wanted to do something else, you got the grant, you know, the mm -hmm. grant was there. All you needed was a university place. I mean, I never... I never actually understood that you had to pay fees to go to university. I mean, the grant to me was was to live off, you know. Uh, but I hadn't, it, it didn't occur to me that that I actually also paid fees. I thought mm. it was all free anyway, you know. Um, so you got a grant and if you got a reasonable degree and you wanted to do postgraduate work and you had decent references, mm -hmm. you got postgraduate grant and so on, on and on it, it, it went, you know, and then suddenly, of course, towards the end of the 1970s, the door slams and that, and uh, mm -hmm. the whole relationship between communities and individuals and the state changes fundamentally, mm -hmm. and we are where we are with that now. Mm -hmm. It's like one of the things the students do, like, I mean, I see like even the final year student, they always struggle to come to the classes because they have work commitment. So work is like very much part and parcel of their education journey. I mean, which is extremely disruptive because, you know, these jobs are obviously very, very low paid and lots of, you know, anxieties there as well for their job situation. Um, sometimes I feel that in the state does it intentionally just to, you know, punish these people and then so that there's not much critical thinking you know when growing up you know and then you will have a very kind of you know very domesticated audience to rule <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's an argument that the historians used to have about um, about school education in the 19th century you know when when uh, the opportunities of, of going even to elementary school became available to people and you could go to school free and stay on until you were 12. The argument there was, well, why are they doing this? You know, is it is it because education is a good thing in itself and, and you want a, 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 you want people to know stuff because it's good to know stuff or do you want raw material to put into the factories and the rest just educated enough in order to let them, you know, 
serve the, the ends of capitalism. It's the same kind of argument. Uh, and it's uh, it's one I'm not taking sides on. Because <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> so like while you were doing PhD, so like who was your supervisor? It was Bill Wallace. Uh, that, oh, I the same said, guy. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, I mean, he, he was very good with me throughout. I mean, uh, mm. it was his references that got me my, my uh, grant to go to the LSE. And then uh, after that, he was, he was the man who decided basically who would be allowed to get grants to do PhDs or DPhils mm. in Austin. So I went back there and uh, he, he became a supervisor. And um, I opted then to, to pursue, so I, I wanted to do something that was Irish related because it, 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 seemed, it seemed a waste to be in Ireland and, and, and not to do a, a, an Irish related topic. But I'd always been kind of interested in the United Nations as an organization and particularly its peacekeeping functions. And in a way, the topic of my research sort of produced itself, you know, because we put these two things together, being an island wanting to get an Irish dimension to what you were doing and thinking about the UN and peacekeeping. Um, the United Nations and being a member of the United Nations was a hugely important part of, of Ireland's contemporary history, you know, it more or less in the 1950s, 1960s, defined Ireland's foreign policy. And, and Ireland was one of the major mm. contributors, troop contributing countries to, to UN peacekeeping operations. It was the main function of the Irish Defence Force mm. from the late 1950s onwards was to to provide uh, to provide United Nations soldiers, so um, the topic kind of just presented itself, and uh, so I got I got on with that, uh, and that was it was fine. It was a good topic to do. Mm -hmm. Did you did you do any field work during your thesis, right? No, I mean other than speak to people when in Dublin and the rest of it, no, the wooden, it wasn't the sort of, it wasn't the, the sort of research I was doing. I mean, what, what I was interested in really was where um, the UN role fitted into the high politics of the Irish state, Irish foreign policy. I wasn't really concerned with, you know, the operational side of it, mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, how far that, that would have affected the high politics. For mm. example, First Congo operation, there were quite high casualties among the Irish contingents, and that impacted, obviously, at the level of mm. government decision-making. But I wasn't really engaged with the, 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 say the operation or the field experience of, of, mm. of, of Irish peacekeepers as such. Mm. Mm. How do you see like Ireland now? Because Ireland is still, I think, not member of NATO. They still have the similar kind of foreign policy that you know, mm. this multilateral approach. It's like you no know, becoming a good citizen in the world. You know, it's kind of something of respectability. And then it's a small country, but it has got lots of allies, friends around the world. And people, you know, think Ireland with like respect. You no, know, these are good guys in the world. Yes, yeah, and that's that's carried on to really from the 1950s, 1960s onwards. I mean, before the UN involvement, Ireland was, was a bit of a dark, misty terra incognita as far as as far as international relations was concerned. It was neutral. Mm. It was neutral in a kind of odd way. It wasn't neutral in a way that, say, Sweden was neutral uh, in a kind of positive activist way. It was neutral because it taken a decision to be neutral after the, after the, the Second World War because it thought that that would be a good way of getting the Americans to bring pressure on the British over 
the border and partition. You know, if the said, right, well, Ireland is, is poised there in the Northwest Atlantic. The Americans really want us in NATO. Uh, Americans really like us because so many Irish Americans. We would just say, we'll join NATO, but only if we get rid of partition. And of course, the Americans weren't interested. <laughs> and so Ireland found itself as a very pro-Western country, as a Catholic pro-Western country, but accidentally neutral. Mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't really until late 1950s that uh, it was actually famous uh, Fianna Foy leader, leader of the, the original Irish uh, revolution, Eamon de Valera, came up with this idea that uh, wouldn't it be good if we turn neutrality into something much more positive and that would give us a clear identity in the world. And that's basically what we did. Uh, Eamon de Valera, along with one of his old comrades in arms from the Civil War days, Frank Aiken, who became the, 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 the foreign minister, uh, forged a kind of Irish identity. Now, it wasn't brand new. That actually, de Valera had done something the same in the 1930s at the League of Nations, uh, but this was a kind of a renewal of that. And so, so neutrality from being what was once described as a sore thumb that will hold up and say, oh, poor little Ireland has to be neutral because we're divided and rest. Neutrality became a much more positive thing, you know, what, what has Ireland got to contribute, not what does Ireland get out of being neutral. And that carried on. And I remember one of the big debates later on was when the possibility of membership of Europe came up when, when mm. Britain was, was going to accede in, in, in 1973. It was almost inevitable Ireland would have to because the two economies were so closely integrated. But there was a strong strong voices in Ireland saying, well, I'm not sure we want to join Europe because that will compromise our neutrality. I mean, it's not joining NATO, obviously, but still, no. you know, we're, we're joined, at that time, almost all of, of Europe, European economic community as it was, were also members of NATO. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there was this quite an active debate. No, the UN is where we want to be. That's where our identity is. We don't want it diluted by getting pulled into, into Europe. But Europe prevailed and Europe gradually became a parallel focus for Ireland, uh, which, of course, mm -hmm. it very much is now. It, it, everybody's aware of, of Ireland's EU identity now. But what's interesting, of course, about this whole part of the reason why I've talked so much about it is not, it's not just a personal obsession, but what's interesting about it is, of course, we're now confronting debates about what an independent Scotland's foreign policy could look like, you know. And uh, of course, Ireland in many respects is, is, is an obvious, model. not a model exactly, but it's, it's, a, it's a, a sort of template for, for, for where Scotland might be uh, in, in terms of a post-independence foreign policy. Mm. Because since you bring Scotland, I'll just like pertinent question. Um, can you see independent Scotland in your lifetime? If you'd asked me that 10 years ago or 20 years ago, I said, oh, no, never. Um, but I can actually know, yeah, I, I can see it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, well, I mean, obviously, if, if your opinion polls are constantly coming out, 50 50, then it doesn't take much to tip it one way or the other. Mm -hmm. and I, I, I could see lots of scenarios where, where that would become a possibility. Yeah. Mm. I want to see you as Scotland's first foreign minister, Nori. <laughs> I think that's your generation, not, 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 not mine. <laughs> Um, but it, 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 yes, I mean, it does, uh, mm -hmm. as I say, 20 years ago. I mean, 
things have got so fast and unpredictable in international relations over the past few years that, that anything is, is now a possibility. Mm. And everything has to be considered a possibility when it yeah. comes to mm. visualizing and planning mm. and building. Mm. Mm. Uh, so like one of the things I really want to touch is because you speak Portuguese, Nori. Mm -hmm. Well, oh. I think not Where so did it come from? <laughs> like, how you get involved in this, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Well, we need to go back to what we were talking about a minute ago when I was doing doctorate in, mm. in, in Northern Ireland. Um, well, if I can go back even before that to what I was talking about when I was a, a sort of callow teenager getting interested in. in the Glasgow anarchist groupings and the rest. But the inspiration, as I said, when we're talking about it at the time, was very much the uh, Spanish Civil War, mm. which is a great totemic uh, <laughs> kind of event in, in, in left wing consciousness. I'd always been interested in Spain and, uh, and, and the Spanish Civil War. And uh, while I was still working on research for the doctorate, uh, along came the Portuguese Revolution in 1974, which of course in a, in a way was a kind of extension of the, 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 the Spanish interest because you did two Iberian dictatorships, the Franco dictatorship mm. in, in, in Spain and the Salazar and then Caetano dictatorship in, in Portugal. And uh, that was, so, again, it's difficult maybe to explain to somebody who wasn't around in, in politics or international politics at that time, but Portuguese revolution was a great event because it seemed to be a victory for progressive forces in a world where progressive forces were on the back foot. Portuguese revolution was 1974, as to say. 1973 had the overthrow of the Allende government in Chile and the arrival of Pinochet. You had the Vietnam War going on, all sorts of bad stuff going on in Southeast Asia and the rest. And then suddenly this kind of positive thing, thing happening. So anyway, the, the Portuguese revolution didn't resolve itself that quickly. And in 1975, during what the Portuguese call the the Kent, the, the hot summer, hot political summer of 1975, actually went to Portugal, mm -hmm. uh, went by train with a Kent in the rucksack and was there for about three weeks, mostly in Lisbon. And it was a great kind of inspiring. It was, it was the furthest that had ever been from home. And it was, it was uh, love at first sight between me and Lisbon, and it, it's still there, it still endures. As a, as a, it's, it's not even my second home, it would be my first home if, if, if that could have been possible. Uh, but that was a very, you know, again, one of these, these sort of seminal experiences. And I got it into my head that uh, the life of a PhD student was all very well, but uh, I'd like to do something a bit more activist. And I discovered it was possible to go to Mozambique mm. as a teacher, uh, because Mozambique had become independent, so independent as part of the, 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 the process of the, the Portuguese revolution. Like arguably, it had been the, the wars, the national liberation wars in Africa that had forced change in Portugal uh, and Mozambique along with Angola along with Guinea-Bissau the other major Portuguese colonies in Africa were pursuing very radical development model um, strongly Marxist inflected uh, development model uh, and so I got myself involved in that sort of thing, decided when the money finally ran out for the, the, the doctorate and I hadn't finished it, that I would go and train as a teacher, which I, which I did 
and uh, at Durham University. And then I got a contract to go to Mozambique. And so I went to Mozambique for two years in the late 1970s. And again, that was one of these kind of things that shape your future where you don't you don't realize that they mm. that, that that's going to happen at the time. Mm. But I mean, that's a huge exposure for you, isn't it? From Europe, from Glasgow, Northern Ireland, then a bit Lisbon, and then straight to Mozambique. I mean, yes, it was. <laughs> it was. You know, it's, it's, it's quite a turbulent time in Mozambique as well. It's, it's not easy post independence, you know, situation. It, it, it was a difficult time. Mm. It, and it was quite dangerous thing because it was the beginning of the civil war. Mm. And I was, I was in city of Beira, which is the second city in Mozambique, but it was the kind of epicenter of a lot of the, mm. the, the tensions that, that, that were developing into the civil war that lasted actually right, right into the early 1990s. Mm. But it was a fascinating time, but uh, not easy. You know, it was, um, mm. A lot of difficulties involved in just living there, you know, not least the fact that you had to learn Portuguese and teach in Portuguese. And you know, within, within a year from not speaking a word of Portuguese, <laughs> you teach history lessons in, in Portuguese. You know? um, so, yeah, that was a. Uh, uh, mm. any, any memories? Because, I mean, I don't think you talk much about your Mozambique experience. I mean, is, is, weren't there any moments, you know, fascinating time where, you know, it, you still think, you know, something flashed back? Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, it, it, it's, it, it was, a, it, it, in many ways, I'd say it was quite difficult because the, the, the national economy was, was falling apart, whether to do with mismanagement or <laughs> Do with the external um, sort of sabotage, sabotage the global financial system can be argued about, but uh, it made it, 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 it did it made life very difficult. You know, I, mean, I, I often remember that so trying to feed yourself could be difficult. You never starved, obviously, but you, you had these odd kind of odd kind of um, experiences where. You couldn't get a loaf of bread, say, or you couldn't, couldn't get a pack of eggs, but you could get all the giant prawns and crayfish and lobster and, and, and avocados and the rest that, that you could eat until you, you were sick of looking at them simply because they were all produced locally. Um, and also, I, I was quite a heavy smoker at the time. And there'd be these periodic... Uh, absences of cigarettes there just wouldn't be cigarettes anywhere to be had uh, if you had a smoker a heavy smoker <laughs> that was uh, that, that was a sobering experience you know so it, it was a, it was a magical time and what i what is sometimes difficult across people now is that you're talking about a period where uh obviously there's no internet uh, there was no communication at all. I mean, you couldn't get telephone lines out in Mozambique, even, you know. Um, so your communication with home, with, with friends, or whatever, was an airmail letter. You know, you sit down and write yourself an airmail letter, post it, and just hope. And it wasn't guaranteed, but just hope that it would actually get to wherever you'd, you'd addressed it to, you know. And that, in that respect, it was quite quite an isolating experience, you know. That you uh, used to you used to panic when, when it, it came to weekends, and I, I didn't have books to read because there's nothing else to do. You would literally sit and stare at a wall um, because. Mm -hmm. Radio reception was rubbish, and the radio, radio was rubbish. <laughs> There's nobody to talk to. At least the first year I was here, it's pretty well known. Um, so it, it was a it, it was mm. an odd experience, but a formative one, you know. Mm. It, you know. Because, like the way I see it, I think you no, know, it's a kind of training ground for you to prepare you for the you know 
the foreseeable future for you as a very resilient, strong-minded, because I mean, it's, it's a kind of boot camp almost like living in that. I, well, to be honest, looking back on it now, I think, um, I think I would have preferred a formative experience before going to Mustang, which would have maybe been a boot camp training that I would have needed to, to, to have, have lived there. Uh, because I mean, I, I got a particular, you got a particular sense in your head about what it was like living in what we used to call the third world, mm. you know, the global south as we call it now. But a few years later, uh, as you probably know, um, we went to work in, in Papua New Guinea. Yeah. Uh, I remember preparing to go to Papua New Guinea and it was all based on the Mozambique experience. And I was like, oh God, I must take paper clips because there were no paper clips in, in Mozambique. Oh, scissors, take pairs of scissors. Um, well, we need lots of paper, to, just paper to write on, you know, and pens, pens, for goodness sake, get us kiss some ballpoint pens in the in, in the in the packing case to go to uh, Papua New Guinea because it was all based on this this sort of hard mm. sort of material existence in Mozambique. Of course, we've got Papua New Guinea supermarkets full of stuff, and it was just basically it was almost like an Australian town, you know, an Australian city and the rest of it. But uh, yes, this. Uh, it, it, it was a formative experience, but I'm not sure what it formed me to do. <laughs> but I mean, if you had wanted, could you could you have stayed more in Mozambique? Yeah, I, 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 I had I had actually intended to go back. Um, I'd left after a two year contract. Uh, which was a contract as a school teacher, and I had sort of arranged to go back to work at university in, in Maputo. Uh, it, it wasn't a firm commitment, but you know, the, the things were in place, things were lined up to, to, to go back. But I think for various reasons, I get back to Britain, and I actually thought, well, I think I'd quite like to finish this doctorate which was one thing that had been left hanging for years, which you couldn't do nowadays, but it was quite common back then, mm. you know, to leave the doctorate for several years and then go back and pick it up. And so as I picked that up and got, got more and more sort of commitments in Britain again, it, and then, you know, the, the, the civil war situation in Mozambique was getting worse and worse and uh, so that it just eventually it didn't happen, didn't, didn't go back. Mm. Started off in, in another direction, you know, because got the doctorate finished and then that kind of began to open up one or two kind of other mm. career opportunities. Mm. I, I really wanted to go back to you, like Mozambique, teaching in a school. I mean, were there any memories you, you, you can still think of, you know, cherished memories? Yeah, I mean, it, it was, yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, uh, I mean, the, the pupils, kids, students were great. And, and we think perhaps we'd had a tough time in Glasgow schools in the 1950s, but 1960s, but uh, there's nothing compared to, to what these kids had to, had to overcome to, to get to school. The, the, the school I was teaching in was uh, an industrial school. Uh, mm -hmm. So although it was general secondary school, it's always, there's also a kind of um, emphasis on mechanics, electrics, you know, different <laughs> of, of, of uh, trade skills and the rest, and that, that's what the, that, that, that's what they were all boys and girls. That's what they were all um, working towards. But uh, yeah, I mean, they, they, were, they had nothing materially, uh, mm. but you know, they, they were they, they extremely good, ex and, you know, very mutually supporting. Um, kids, you know, mm. uh, in a way, I kind of, uh, I regret, it was, it was all right towards the end, but I do regret not having 
had sufficient Portuguese really to, to engage as much as I would have liked to, you know, everything tended to be a bit stilted, you had to kind of prepare yourself, to prepare your lessons very carefully and, and the rest of it, but I would have, it would have been nicer to have, to have had more of an entree into, into the, their, their society and, and the way they lived and, and their background and, mm. and the rest. And, and I also, I mean, as the war got worse and I was back in Europe, and, and as I say, Bayra was a, a bit of an epicenter for the war and the area around about it where the kids mm. came from. I used to really wonder and worry about what, what had happened to them, you know, because mm. the, uh, you know, the, the death rate in the Mozambican Civil War was very, very high. And they were just of an age where they were mm. vulnerable to to mm. it. You know. um, mm. So yeah, and that's I don't I don't really have any connection still with that time in Mozambique, other than with a couple of um, other foreigners who were there mm. working with me at the time. I don't really have any connection with mm. it. Mm. Because, I mean, it's especially like, I mean, when Mozambique got into independence, it's like kind of suddenly it became Soviet sided state, kind of you no know, so called Marxist state, like the socialist state. So you're living in a kind of that kind of socialist setting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, that was, it was it was highly politicized. Uh, and, and being a teacher, of course, you were contracted to state, contracted to the government. Um, it wasn't always comfortable, actually, you know, because mm. it, it was it was increasingly authoritarian. It was a precious the civil war. Maybe it was just the logic of the sort of politics they were they were following. Uh, it could be quite depressing because you had people getting to the top of institutions and top of government, well, not to the very top of government, but get to prominent roles, who you could see were plainly opportunists. They were, you know, they, they, they were going to, they were going to, they were going to float to as high as they could, wherever they were, in whatever kind of circumstances. And I always got the feeling it was a kind of a natural alliance between the peasants and the working class who were getting quite strongly engaged with the revolution and the very top levels of government who were all ex guerrillas from, the, from the, the, the liberation war days. But between the two of them, it was this kind of opportunistic middle class mm -hmm. that was increasingly taken over the levers of power locally, you know, um, and it was the, that that's where corruption starts to get into the into mm. the, the system you know and, and i'm afraid that's what happened to, to a great extent mm. uh, but yeah i mean uh, the, the, there were a few other brits there but most of the the uh most of the foreign workers cooperants as they were called mm. came from eastern europe and from cuba mm. And that in itself, the dynamics there were quite good because it, everybody loved the Cubans. They were great. Mm. Uh, and they'd do anything uncomplaining. Whereas a lot of the, the, the fraternal East European sort of comrades were, shall we say, had a tendency towards some fairly coarse racism in their, their attitude. <laughs> And uh, didn't didn't like the discomforts that they were that, that they were being required to face in, in this this strange environment, you know. Uh, so as far as Mozambican reaction to foreigners were concerned, the Cubans were great, but they didn't didn't really mm. like the Cubans very much. Mm. weren't too keen on the Bulgarians, you know. Mm. East Germans were a bit problematic. Um, yeah, there are also, interestingly, quite a lot of Portuguese from ah. the Portuguese communist tradition, you know, 
uh, and they well they could be a bit richer than each other, but uh, you know but what, what we'd call tankies nowadays you know because sort of, uh, Portuguese Communist Party was always backward looking but Stalinist compared to other West European communist parties there were a lot a lot of them there mm. and they they had their own issues because there were still Portuguese settlers there who of course had great difficulty coming to terms with the the, the mm. way things were, were working and uh, so you yeah, had these kind of odd tense relationships between Portuguese settlers and the Portuguese communists <laughs> that, that had come in. Um, so lots of, lots of interesting things to observe. <laughs> Because like one of the fascinating thing about, you know, this Cuba's role during that time, so like lots of Cuban soldiers were in Angola, in Mozambique and couple other countries as well. So they are trying to, you know, ex expand their internationalist idea about, you know, we are the same brothers and we have to help each other. Um, how did you find this like Cuban, this, this kind of, you know, commitment? Was it really commitment or just like, is like, just like, you know, Ireland tried to become a, you know, good citizen in the Soviet bloc. No, I, th I think it was quite genuine. Uh, I think it was genuine solidarity. Um, one thing to say is there were no, uh, no Cuban military personnel in Mozambique. It was in Angola, of course, mm. massive in Angola. Mm. But in, in Mozambique, there were all doctors, teachers, yeah. parents, you know. Uh, and I do think it, it, it was it was a, a genuine internationalist thing on the part of Castro that uh, that that he, he felt it was it, it was a commitment to to the third world as it would have been called at, the, at that time and that in many ways Cuba was was an actual was an actual leader of that. Mm. Um, I mean, it carries on because latterly, as you know, I, I worked for the UN in, in, in mm. Timor Leste. Now, Cuban doctors there, and they were, they were there in, in much the same way as they were in Mozambique. They were earning tiny amounts of money. They were getting basically paid what they could pay in Cuba in a very high cost economy, as, as it was in, in Timor Leste. But, mm very uncomplaining, very committed to, to what they were, they were doing. I mean, really thoroughly admirable. Mm. Mm. Yeah. No, it's just like, you know, the how, because when you live in the West for certain years, mm. I mean, you have got different understanding about countries, about people, like, so like my, you know, like my exposure to this kind of politics is, that's obviously, Cuba was a kind of rogue state for me when I was growing up in Bangladesh, you know, it's like that's the way they were portrayed in the popular media, you know, um, and I think it kind of makes sense now why, you know, the knowledge information is really, really powerful. It, it creates serious discourse for audience, for people, and then the state can take advantage of those things. And you can say that, yeah, that's a rogue state, so you need to do something about that. Mm -hmm. then, the, then the populace, the citizens support that kind of move because they created this discourse. These are actually evil people. Um, yeah. So like that, that dehumanization is, is seriously there. But at the same time, you are talking about those history, those story about Cuban doctors who are in Mozambique working for a very tiny, tiny money. Um, it's a serious commitment, serious dedication. Oh yeah, very much so. And and as so what, what was striking about about it was that where where in Mozambique, for example, other people are working there, East Europeans and West Europeans as well. And myself, I mean, we complain, complain, complain about conditions and about difficulties and about the government and the rest. But the striking thing about the, the Cubans was they just got on with it, you know. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't because they were intimidated or that they felt that, you know, they had to behave themselves. It was, it was just a mindset, you know, we're, we're here to do a job, we're here to express solidarity with mm. another country trying to follow a socialist path or whatever. Uh, so we go on with it, we do it. 
you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, <laughs> the only thing against them uh, is that they were brutal, brutal volleyball players. Really. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been so humiliated in a sport in my life as <laughs> volleyball with kids. <laughs> because you are you are quite a tall man, so I mean, <laughs> you should do well in the volleyball. <laughs> but I mean, Cubans are quite good in sports, like you know other other sports as well. They do well in the Olympics historically. Um, hmm. So, like, if I compare all those, you no. Know, if compared to the socialist country, I think Cuba is always like to me is as a good. I, mean, I don't know, like it's like my kind of model where health system is good, you know, lots of things are good. It just you no, know, the they need to just tweak a bit of their, you know, the this like governance, like you no know, kind of very strong that kind of trend, the centralized government with like some kind of connection, historical connection, Castro family members and all those things. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, 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 yeah, it, it, it's easy to, to kind of build up a picture of false utopia. I mean, you, mm-hmm. you can't forget the, the, the degree of, of repression against dissident intellectuals and the rest in, in Cuba, or the the homophobic, official homophobic kind of line that the government took for years and years and years. You know, you've got you've got to acknowledge these things, mm. but then you've got to put the whole thing into into uh, a broader perspective of where Cuba was, the problems it was facing, the enemies it was facing. Mm. Mm. The way I always looked at it, if you go back to think of it, say. 1970s, 1980s, and think, well, if I was going to be a Caribbean person or a Central American person, where would I want it to be, you know? Would I want it to be in Haiti? Would, would I want it to be in, in El Salvador? Or would I want it to be in Cuba? And it's just not an argument. You know? It's yeah. just not an argument. Yeah. Um, and that, that is, that's an achievement. And that it's actually Fidel Castro's achievement, there's no doubt mm. about it. Mm. You know, you can you can say a lot against the man in terms of yeah. in terms of the social attitudes, tendency towards authoritarian repression and mm. uh, backward looking uh, attitudes towards things like as I say, sexual orientation, mm. but but uh, there's no escape in fact that mm. the man mm. You know, as a giant of the twentieth century, mm. and, uh, and his mm. achievements were were considerable, massive. Mm. Mm. One of the discussion is like, you know, we are good countries; they are bad countries. Like that kind of arguments. I mean, with me, I I'm like more like John Mearsheimer kind of guy. I don't see the states are, you know, good or bad. I mean, they will do whatever they need to do anyway. So. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but at the same time, my left politics says that we actually don't, states are inherently, you know, bad entity anyway. So, I mean, as long as the states are there, there will be always, you know, social hierarchy, this class struggle, and all those problems will be there. Um, but some people think that the state is important because, you know, law and order. And then my argument is what law and order? You know, so law and order for whom? It looks mm. like if you are. Yeah. Our full ruling yeah. class, you don't need to worry about you know, <laughs> law and order. <laughs> well, let me take you back to, to, to something we were talking about much earlier, and that's the, the difference, different experience that I had as a student from the experience that a contemporary university student would have. Now, when I was becoming a kind of good Marxist in, uh, in, in, in my late teens and, and 20s and the rest, you know, I, I had to accept this, this idea that the capitalist state was basically the enemy and that the, the state was, uh, was um, always going to pursue the interests of the dominant economic class and the rest of it. 
But there was a cognitive dissonance for me because, as I just said, the state, to me, as a working class boy from Glasgow, had actually been very, very benign, you know? Health service, free education, decent housing, university education, all provided by the capitalist state. Mm. You know? mm. And obviously that's a social democratic argument, mm. but, but it's quite difficult. On one hand, the, one side you have your head say, right, we dismiss the capitalist state and all its evil doings. But mm. they'll say, wait a minute, you know, I mean, health service, decent education, good housing. You know? <laughs> It, 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 it's a difficult, it's a very difficult thing to, mm, to mm. you know, but, to reconcile. Mm. But do you not think that, you know, it's nothing to do with like socialism or any, any political ideological stuff. It's more to do with like, as long as we have those things, you know, good healthcare, you know, education system, good housing, you know, all the social political goods, then we don't care who the state is or what kind of ideology, you know as long as those things there. And if it is everywhere in the world, then, you know, that's the utopia ultimate, you know. Oh, well, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's, uh, you know, there would be an argument for saying, I think it's quite a strong argument, a social democratic argument, as I say, mm. that, okay, the state might be providing all these benefits to you out of some kind of complicated conspiratorial reason but they're still providing them. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, and mm. it's, that, that's why, I mean, I've, over the years, I've evolved mo- into much more of a social democrat yep. than mm. a revolutionary Marxist, you know, mm. because it's, it's partly experience, it's partly aging, I don't know. But um, mm. uh, the, there are no utopias. Uh, all we can do is make, make mm. the circumstances we find ourselves in, which also means persuasion, bringing mm. people inside and the rest of it. Mm. And, uh, mm. that's, that's really the only way we can go. So I really want to touch a bit, you know, the current situation, this like, you know, this conundrum with this Ukraine situation. And then I try to see like, you know, the Bosnia good example, how, you know, things, and then, you know, how NATO came into the equation. Um, I mean, I, I did a podcast with like very Marxist guy with Vijay Prasad, and he was saying that, you know, he was quite critical about NATO, and he was, he, he was like, made a very funny comment that, I mean, uh, Bangladesh should apply for membership for NATO as well. <laughs> um, it was, it's, it's, it, the last time I looked, Bangladesh wasn't actually in the North Atlantic, but... <laughs> But lots of countries are not in the North Atlantic either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but also like NATO was going to, you know, Afghanistan, other places as well. So like lots of things happening. Um, and then I also made a very slight comments about that, you know. I think NATO should open for individual membership as well. You know, I should apply for NATO membership myself. Because <laughs> it looks like, you no know, NATO provides Mm. kind of security and other things um so like when we teach bosnia we see we see like there are problems there mm-hmm. the peacekeeping and then nato because they try to do something there on the ground but mm-hmm. lots of mischiefs happened on the ground um can you give us some kind of like i mean i mean what was happening in bosnia and why it was so difficult but at the same time, at the end, it looks like very easy. You know, Sabrinica happened and then something, everyone says, oh my God, stop it. And then war finished. Well, my, my take in Bosnia has always been that the UN involvement there was an attempt to apply a kind of outdated model of peacekeeping to a situation where it, it just wasn't appropriate. So to a great extent, UNPROFOR in, in Bosnia was a peacekeeping operation that would have been more comfortable in the 1960s than it would have been in the 1990s. It was trying to be an interpositionary 
presence that would keep sites apart. It was trying to be a presence that would be automatically respected because it was under the blue flag in the rest of it. Mm -hmm. But it was actually facing an enormously complex communal, set of communal uh, conflicts and, and, and relationships. Uh, and what wasn't needed was interposition. What was needed was some form of enforcement. But for various reasons, that, that enforcement just wasn't, wasn't forthcoming. And, and you can point the finger in all sorts of directions as to why that, that was the case. Uh, not least perhaps at Britain, you know, and it's, it was willing to contribute massive amounts of, of, of troops to, to Unperform Bosnia, but it wasn't willing to, to mandate them to, to, to actually do anything in the way of enforcement. So it was a kind of institutional inertia that, that Unperform was stuck in this old fashioned uh, approach to UN peacekeeping. And the only way the things are going to be resolved really would be if they were kind of pushed aside and another agency come in with the resources and the will to enforce a solution. And I think that's basically what happened in 1995 mm. after the Shrinitsa, after the Saudi mm. mm. uh, attacks. Uh, it, was, it was basically, I think, the CNN effect had operated in American public and European publics and the rest. And so it was time now we had the public on side. It's possible now to, to act decisively in an in, in enforcement mm. way. And that's what that's what NATO did. Operation Deliberate Force, I think it was called. Mm. 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 But so I, I think that was the issue. And then of course, come Kosovo a few years later. Um, you could argue the lesson had been learned that there was no point in trying to put in an interpositionary peacekeeping mm. presence. You just had to move straight to enforcement. Uh, mm. And that's basically what happened. Mm. I mean, especially post 90s, I mean, we, we cannot see this interpositional situation where most of the you know, situation is just interstate and like this like, communal things. So the consent is really difficult. When you talk about classic peacekeeping model, um, mm. but at the same time you get involved with some kind of Chapter Seven enforcement power, but not within that. Like I think Article Forty Two, which is like you know full force, it's it mm. just in between. And then at the same time you promise that you will save the civilians and you create those safe havens, the small kind of pockets, and that people can go there. And at the same time, those people who are not protected at the end. So it created a lot of political, you know, yeah. oddballs. I, I, think, I think UN peace operations now are, are going through a major identity crisis. Mm. Uh, and uh, on the one hand, you, you, you've you had in the past 10 years a move towards so-called stabilization operations. And stabilization really is a, a euphemism for enforcement. So you've, you've had uh, the intervention force in, in Democratic Republic of Congo, you've had the force in Mali, and you've had force in Central African Republic, all of which are basically, well, they call themselves stabilization forces, but they're to a great extent acting as the enforcement arm of the state. Mm. That's the mandate is to support the state and to attempt to stabilize the situation basically, in order to create space for the, for the state to, to take control. And that's highly controversial, of course, because you, the UN is that way associating itself with what can be some very dodgy people uh, in, 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 in government, you know. But on the other hand, operating against that now is the fact that I mean, I know there's a lot of discourse about the Second Cold War and the rest, and I don't want to go there, but there is a new bipolarity that's opened up, and Ukraine has just cast that into sharp light. I mean, it's been, it's been on the way for the past 10 or 15 years. And what that's doing is almost pointing back 
to Cold War peacekeeping as the only model that can work, a kind of minimal approach rather than going in as an enforcement operation, rather than in as a complex multi-level uh, operation of the sort you had in East Timor, for example. Mm -hmm. That all you go, if, 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 if peace operations are going to continue, the only basis of which they can continue is on, obviously, the basis of consensus within the Security Council. If the Security Council is divided, then their mandates are going to be extremely limited. Um, and I think there's, there's now some thinking about this. Or, or, or is it back to the future? You know, or, or, or we've got to rediscover what you could almost call Hamushaldian peacekeeping again, you know, the, the peacekeeping model that Doug Hamushald put forward in the 1950s and early 1960s. Because my view of the international politics of peacekeeping has always been that it takes place within what could be called a permitted space. Mm. And that space is a permitted space, both in a political and a geographical sense. And it's permitted by the permanent members of the Security Council. So the space expands and contracts, expands and contracts, depending on the nature of the relationships within the Security Council at any one point in history. So immediately after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the space expanded. And so peacekeeping, both in terms of its mandates, but also areas of the world which are operated, um, had a much freer hand than it ever had under the conditions of the Cold War. But now that permitted space is contracted and contracted again because of the nature of the relationship between the major powers and Security Council. Mm -hmm. And it's contracted, as far as I can see, to a point that's taken us back almost to the Cold War of the 1950s and 1960s. And, and it's a reality that has to be mm. has to recognize, I think. Mm. Because then that brings the question about, you know, um, I mean, there's a thing famous quote that thou shalt not make peace unless there is a peace to keep. So like places like, you know, Ukraine or uh, we, we cannot even think about any kind of peacekeeping situation there at all because, you know, it, it's just not there. There's no chance for peacekeepers to do anything there. Um, but going back to like Bosnia, um, do you think that similar situation, because there was no peace to keep it, the Europe and the West was more trying to contain the war, you know, so that it doesn't get totally, you know, get exploded, I mean, uh, which they try to do, uh, but at the cost of serious civilian, you know, deaths. Yeah. Well, um, is there any lesson to learn from Bosnia? Well, oh, I mean, that, that, that larger point you touched on about uh, don't try and keep the peace until there's peace to keep is something that was, I think, a hard lesson learned uh, during the 1990s that the UN peace operations became more and more ambitious. Mm. And they were getting themselves involved more and more in situations where there wasn't peace to keep. Or if there was apparently a peace to keep, it was a very fragile one with which the United Nations itself had had no input, you know? Mm. So go to Rwanda, say, rather than Bosnia. Uh, okay, there was a UN force that was there to keep a peace that had been agreed, but it was a very, very fragile peace. And the UN had, had no say in the nature of it, but it was being pulled in to keep the peace and it all went terribly, terribly wrong. Mm. Same thing in Angola. Year after year, there'd be some kind of agreement between the mm. MPL and UNITA to calm things down or to have a ceasefire. The UN would come in to try and maintain it. But of course, they were just kind of joke ceasefires, you know. And so then the UN would find itself trying mm. to keep peace in, in, in the middle of... of, of military chaos. So yes, I think that that, that is a lesson that has to be learned and you get a lot of loose talk about what's the UN doing in Ukraine or more likely what's the UN not doing in Ukraine. Mm. 
train. Mm. So, what do you mean by the UN? And what do you suggest? You know, that's, uh, that's where it comes down to. Mm. Um, and then you get wilder talk about saying, oh, well, OK, if Russia is a problem, just throw Russia out of the UN and that will be fine. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it gets crazy. It's, it's unrealistic expectations and a failure to grasp the realities of, of, of world politics. Like in terms of Bosnia, one of the things I still struggle, you know, like to take a position, um, like when like NATO force bombed Belgrade. What's your take on that? You no, know, do you think it was one of those things? You no, know, they had to do it. There's no other options there. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think talk with Kosovo rather than, than Bosnia yeah, than yeah. talk about bombing Belgrade. <laughs> Who's to say? I don't know. I mean, the. Kosovo didn't develop into another Bosnia. So mm. to that extent. So be was, yeah. Kosovo still isn't an independent state in the international system. So to that extent, it, it wasn't successful. I mean, it's lots of what ifs and, and, and the rest. I mean, I don't I think there are a lot of very bad mistakes made in the bombing of Serbia itself um, during that conflict. But really, again, move yourself back into the late 1990s and after the experience of things like the Srebrenica massacre and the attacks in, in Sarajevo and the rest, you, you should inclined to say, well, let's not make that mistake again. Mm. If we're going to do this, let's do it properly and let's stop talking about peacekeeping and start talking about a responsibility to protect, which is mm. basically what the Kosovo operation was the idea that the, the, the responsibility to protect hadn't been evolved fully at that time, but that was basically what Kosovo was about liberal interventionism. Mm, mm, mm. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult to, it's difficult, I think, from this distance to see whether it was, whether it was. Mm. To, Denounce it entirely. I mean, mm. I, at the time, I felt it was probably the right thing to do. Mm. To, the way of preventing a much worse evil, a much worse, mm. worse, worse development. Problem with Kosovo is its relative success buoyed up, uh, particularly Tony Blair's sort of interventionist instinct, mm. and so mm. Bosnia leads to Kosovo. Okay, that's fair enough. But then Kosovo leads to Iraq, you know, and uh, then that intervention can look quite different. Now, now he's a potential war criminal. Well, yeah, mm. you go from responsibility to protect to to you know, being a war criminal. So. so, like today, there's a the news that I mean, I think even Secretary General is meeting Putin. I think today. Or tomorrow mm -hmm. what do you think like what 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 kind of policy advice you give to <laughs> Antonio Guterres about you know like I mean, how to how to deal with Putin I, I honestly I, I don't know um I think it I think it, 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 much of this is, is basically to show that the UN is doing something that the mm -hmm. UN does have a, a presence it does have have a role to play. But um, yes, you can maybe bring a bit of moral uh, here when it comes to things like humanitarian corridors and the rest. And it might actually be useful for Putin to accede to some of these requests because it then sort of rehabilitates Russia's international mm -hmm. reputation. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, the Secretary General has made a a plea directly to us and we will accept that because the Secretary General has done it. And whatever the motivation, if the end result is positive, then, then fair enough. Mm. But as far as a major UN peace operation role is concerned, I wouldn't write it off entirely. 
mm. because mm. it is an exit strategy. You mm. know, mm. It, it is a possibility, but it only becomes a possibility when you get mm. resolution in the Security Council, which isn't vetoed by one of the five permanent members. In other words, when mm. the United Nations can be operationalized mm. in the state interests mm. of the major parties. Mm. And that's when it works. That's the only time really that it works. Mm. Mm. It's this thing, go back to this metaphor of the permitted space. You know, mm. How much space are we going to give the UN mm. for its peace operations? And what do we get out of it? Mm. Mm. I mean, when I teach peacekeeping, especially UNEF, the first peacekeeping force um, during the Swiss crisis, when my students read your book and then they talk about this, you know, this magic formula, so that you know every country thinks that, yeah, you know, I am happy with that position, like France, UK, Israel, is it? Everyone thinks that I won. Um, so I think we are talking about that magic formula, some kind of exit like strategy for Putin. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Putin says, right, well, the world recognizes our legitimate security concerns and now we have got enough confidence to allow the United mm -hmm. Nations to, to look after our concerns. The West says, right, that's the UN moving in, getting the Russians out. Mm -hmm. We've, you know, so mm -hmm. everybody's, everybody's happy. That's the ideal situation mm. Mm. Um, that might be a long way down the track in, in Ukraine but it's, it's not completely unforeseeable mm. Mm. because the, the US's position is this is the opportunity to you know weaken Russia and then you know that's like more global geopolitics um, that's also playing a role there in, in this Ukraine war dynamic um, um, lots of scholars might say that, oh, that's quite dangerous way to, you know, expand or like, you know, continue this war because Putin at that, like, I mean, even like yesterday, like US State Department was saying that, yeah, uh, Putin is brutalizing Ukraine, but Ukraine is winning. So like, what does it mean? I mean, so like the Ukraine is losing lots of lives on the ground, but at the same time, they're winning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, for for one thing, I think that the information flows, intelligent flows, are very unreliable at the minute. I mean, there's, mm. there's enough more guesswork. One one thing that struck me about the coverage of, of this war is how little immediate information seems to be available publicly. Mm. You know, uh, there's no kind of systematic flow of information mm. uh, coming more generally to the public. I don't know. I mean, my, my own sense of, of Ukraine is that if you've, got to, if you've got to look for a silver lining in the, the broad kind of historical tapestry, um, it has finally knocked on the head the fond notion that the world operates on a rule-based system. You know? Now, analysts, academics have been saying for decades now that we need to forget this. Uh, each stage, whether it's you know, sort of breakdown of relationships within the Security Council, whether it's Brexit for that master, all the signs are pointing to a breakdown of a rule-based system. Um, now, analysts, have, academics have been willing to play with that idea, but state leaders have kind of refused to even think about it. It's, it's as, if, as, as if they can't contemplate it, you know, that, that, that we must be operating in a rule-based system because if we're not, we're falling mm -hmm. into this, you know. I think what Ukraine has shown now is that we, we, the model of the 1930s is much more appropriate than the model of the 1990s. That, that, that the rule-based system we thought we'd established in 1945 and we thought had been consolidated after 1990 with the end of the Cold War does not 
doesn't exist anymore and mm. it's going to have to be rebuilt. Um, mm. It's going to take quite a bit of rebuilding. Mm. Uh, but as, as I say, I think it, it, it's maybe a cold shower for mm. readers that, that mm. overdue, you know. I mean, perhaps like I'm over ambitious. Sometimes, you know, I feel like in this Angola example where like this one guy, Jonas Savimbi, you know, was doing this fight and fight. And then at the end when he got killed and then the, everything is <laughs> done, <laughs> the, the peace came suddenly. So perhaps it's just one man. It's perhaps just Putin. <laughs> yeah, but, at the same time, but at the same time, Putin is like, you know, such a powerful, you know, structure. I mean, I just cannot see the breakthrough there, you know, like to infiltrate that castle yeah. he built yeah. around him. It, it, it is very interesting. I mean, I, th I think for a, even at the beginning of the Ukraine crisis, people were saying, well, Putin is only there because of his transactional relationship mm -hmm. with the oligarchs that they all give each other what they want and it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky kind of relationship but it's a very solid one but it, it's become clear and clearer I think that that might have been the case for the first couple of years of Putin's rule but gradually he's come to dominate the, 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 the oligarchs are, are his creatures and no okay they're, they're, they're doing well out of it but there's no no sense that it's an equilibrium between Putin on the one hand looking after the politics and the oligarchs on the other hand supporting them and, and bleeding, the, mm. bleeding the state resources while, while they're doing it. Mm. So there, there is, it's a, bit like, it's a bit like Stalin in, in the early yep. 1950s. Who is, 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 going to, is, is going to actually challenge him, you know? Mm. Um, it, it's it's Savimbi, and it's a fair example. But Savimbi uh, had his enemies. So obviously, was fighting the civil war. And yeah. that's it's a risky mm -hmm. business. But of course, mm -hmm. it, it's not what what mm -hmm. applies. To it. But mm -hmm. it is actually very difficult to see how mm -hmm. you really move on ahead as, as mm -hmm. long as it's there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially like I mean, when I I was reading. This, like I think FT a couple of days ago, and it says like Biden just endorsed eight hundred million dollar security aid for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. But the other side of the argument is Putin is actually making one billion dollar a day by selling natural gas and all those things, and the most of the buyers are still actually the West. Mm -hmm. So like you no, know, Putin has got serious upper hand in terms of you know the military strength on the ground. Because I mean, this way, that way, I, I don't see like NATO is getting involved, you know, face, face to face way, you know, it would be still like some kind of proxy kind of, you know, Soviet invasion in Afghanistan, that kind of model. But I mean, if these things continue this way, I mean, Putin can seriously, you know, destroy everything and everyone in Ukraine. That's, that's my serious worry. It is a concern, and, and again, if you're going to look for a silver lining at all, then it, it might be that the West realizes that it can't, uh, it, it, it can't go on in this sort of dependent relationship mm -hmm. for with Russia, and that, that it, it does something serious to free itself of that. Once it's free of that, of course, the picture for Russia looks a lot different because it's fundamentally it's not a strong economy. It's got it's got these resources that it, these are strategic resources that it can deploy strategically. But once that is gone, once once the capacity to, to to deploy these resources strategically is gone, it does have problems, mm. fundamental problems. Mm. But it's very difficult to know what the what the reaction to that is in, in Russia. I mean, it is, I suppose, I mean, at one point, it was a feeling that, well, since the late 1990s, Russians have become very used to a kind of Western standard of, of living and the rest of it. And if that's threatened, then 
it will be a self-correcting thing in terms of the regime, but I'm not even sure if that is true. I mean, the, the way uh, the Russian public does seem to be going along with this and, and willing to put up with sanctions and privations and the rest uh, would be quite chilling for, for the longer term. You know? mm. Again, maybe that is going back to the 1930s for the mm. Russian population, or 1940s for the Russian population mm. is willing to put up with, with, with mm. horrific problems because they were being told that this was necessary in the, in the interests of Russia. Because mm. mm. that's quite interesting argument that, you know, the, these natural resources which Putin has got now, it's like, you know, it's not like unlimited resource, it will run out. Um, so rather we should wait, but also it's, it's linked with like our climate justice politics as well, which is, you know, renewable energy and all those things and the equation. So lots of other things kind of fit in in that argument. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think it's something that I think uh, environmental activists might not want to come out publicly and say for obvious reasons. But the whole situation surrounding Ukraine is probably going to be advantageous in terms of, of the whole climate change situation that you know that people that's forcing people into into renewables. Uh, the price rises cutting down, you know, the energy usage, whether it's in your cars or your home, whatever. All, all this is the stuff that we could only dream about at COP last, you know, last November. <laughs> mm. and, but as I say, it's not the sort of thing a climate activist would want to make too much of because the, the origins of, of this positive development for, mm. for uh, the carbon footprint, the global carbon footprint, is uh, the, the horrors that are going on in Ukraine. Mm. But you're right. I mean, there's the, the, the there are odd, odd kind of currents and countercurrents all, all all around these 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 issues. Always has had. Mm. Mm. No, like lots of like the other moral things I struggle with. Like you know, so like. People are worried about, you know, Boris Johnson did those parties, so he's not a good guy, you know, all those things. So the society is very idealistic about, you know, who could be the right prime minister. But at the same time, when he, when like UK establishment sells all those arms, little weapons to the countries like Saudi Arabia, that doesn't seem like any kind of in the public discourse at all. People seems like okay with that. So like, did you see like the, the, the serious thing they're doing behind the scene is much more pernicious, much more, you know, dangerous than, you know, just like party gate. So, but the, st the, the citizens are more worried about, you know, his behavior, personal behavior, rather than the actual damage he's doing. I mean, um, I think it was ever worse, ever thus, it was public interest is, is, is going to be an interest in, in things like personal behaviour, things like uh, personal morality, but the, the bigger morality of things like the global arms trade and the rest, mm. not so much, you know. It's, it's, it's always been, been the case, really. Mm. And of course, the idea of arms supplies now, selling arms to Saudi Arabia or the Gulf states or whatever, it's never a good idea or to Israel or, or, or mm. any of the major recipients of, of, of the, the, the British uh, armaments industry. But now with the Ukraine situation, of course, supplying arms has become a good thing. We'll take money out of the equation, but, you know, well, if we didn't have this big, healthy arms industry, we wouldn't be able to give Ukraine all these weapons. And it's only a big healthy arms industry because we sell weapons to, mm. to dodgy states in the Middle East or, or, or whatever. So, you know, again, it's another one of these cross currents. It's, mm. uh, it's a kind of you know, unintended consequences of, of, of particular events. Mm. So, like, I'm, I'm like aware of time. We'll come back, but I mean, I think. Um, <laughs> 
do do you feel angry about you know that when these things happen you know like you know a country suddenly you know invaded another country and then say that they will fix it i mean yeah i i mean the the thing about ukraine is that it, it's 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 normally easier to say well 20% of the blame lies here and 80% lies there or 30% lies there 70% lies here it's very difficult in ukraine quite honestly i mean this mm-hmm. this is 1930s type level of of mm-hmm. aggression you know um i'm i'm really not sure I, I, what what in a sense is interesting is that those who are against the war are against it on the basis that it's a war they're not against it on the basis of the morality of the issues involved you know mm. uh, so I, I don't I, I don't see how you really you can be anything but angry you know and it raises raises i mean there's all sorts of interesting questions i think get raised here but we've touched on already about the attitude of the russian public to this and you hear all this stuff about well putin controls the media and that's what the, the only source of information they get is official and the rest of it but i'd like to believe that but I, I think that's, that's a bit sort of comforting you know and it, it shouldn't be because the russian public know that he has systematically shut down independent voices in the media. I mean, they can't be so stupid as to see the performative nonsense that they get on, on news programmes and, and believe it, you know. At some level or other, there is some kind of raw Russian nationalism involved in it. Mm. And that, 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 in a way, is worrying because... The nice liberal view is that well, of course, if we keep if we, if we give them good information flows, you know, if we beam BBC World Service at them twenty four hours a day and the rest, that will be fine. We'll learn. I don't think we will. You know, <laughs> it's the same sort of arguments over Brexit. You know, how can people be so stupid as to believe what they've been told about this? Well, they might have motives for believing it, which we might not want to believe that people actually have, you know, a sort of raw nationalism in the case of Russia as regards Ukraine or mm. sort of underlying racism of a lot of the Brexit discourse and we say, oh, well, it's because people have been believing things that we read in the side of buses, you know, but, you know, that doesn't, doesn't really work, you know. In fact, in a, in a sense, you're disrespecting people if you say that that's stupid. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. uh, but mm-hmm. then, the, the 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 logical conclusion of that line of thinking is that well, people maybe aren't as liberal as one is oneself you know, when it when it comes to trying to understand different sides of debates. And, and come to a, an informed conclusion on mm. and especially this is the like perfect you know fertile ground for you know inciting those nationalism and all those things and we saw like what nationalism does at the end um is, is the most dangerous ideology i mean to me like you know what india is doing right now you know in terms of the trying to dig india you know try to find the nation <laughs> and, yeah. then, and then try to say that you know you are the insider and the rest is the outsider they came here you know that. so mm-hmm. those are much more dangerous yeah it's it's, it's yeah it's, it's again what you hope we're really talking about sort of unlikely and unintended consequences you know mm-hmm. brexit again well brexit is very good for india because britain now is desperate to get a straight deal and and so Modi is 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 consolidated in power. You know, it, it's I don't I mean I I didn't follow up that closely, but I was quite interested with Johnson's visit there for all the all the cultural stuff he was doing was Hindu cultural stuff. But I don't think there was any 
Muslim cultural stuff, maybe I'm wrong, but it, the whole thing was being choreographed in Modi's interests. And of course, Johnson just heartlessly goes along with it because mm. he needs mm. them. You know? mm. So it, it's... But, um, but it's like, you know, the things we use now is like cognitive dissonance. Like, mm. So Johnson is very critical about Putin, who's a fascist, but also he's quite happy to visit a fascist leader. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so, I mean, I think lots of problem in terms of our politics, the politics we, had, we have been doing. Um, I, would, I would just say, though, I mean, it was in my mind, again, the context, what we're talking about Scotland and Ireland much, mm -hmm. much earlier. You're talking about the, the, the sort of toxic, uh, toxic force of nationalism. Mm -hmm. You've always got to separate out self-determination, which is an entirely yeah. legitimate yeah. and, and you know, admirable objective from nationalism as xenophobia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, so when you're talking about nationalism, I know exactly what you mean. You're talking about blood and soil nationalism. You're not talking about the nas civic nationalism or self-determination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd better just put that in. <laughs> <laughs> no, like sometimes, like, you know, I, I, with my, the seminar sessions are really funny, you know, so I just like incite the students and they try to, you know, pin me down. You know? mm -hmm. no, no, no. Are you proud of your country? It says, no, I'm not proud of any country. <laughs> what does it mean even? You know, like, yeah. it says, no, I'm, 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 I'm German. I'm really proud of German. I'm like, how does it work? It's, no, that Germany provides me, you know, education, you know, provides me, you know, all those good things. But at the same time, Germany did lots of bad things for other people as well. Mm. So like, which Germany you are proud of? Yeah, quite. <laughs> Perhaps I'm getting old now, Nori. Yeah. <laughs> Very cynical about things. Um, so like, just a couple of last thing I want to touch. Uh, I know you, you, you read a lot, just for our future, you know, reference so that we can read some of your favorite books, I mean, um, any recommendation for our students or even for me, you know, any book you find? Well, any books at all? Or any books, any book, mean, anything. It, it doesn't anything. have to be politics. No, I, my reading has always been very eclectic. It's uh, uh, mostly novels over the last, the last few years, but I'm finding that I'm reading very, very slowly. And I was just saying to to Betsy the other day, I've got into this odd habit where I'll, I'll get through a novel and I'm really enjoying it, but the last 30 pages will take me about a month to read. I don't know why it is, but it's just whether I want to draw it out. But no, I've, there's been, I've been enjoying some, some, good, some good novels. I've enjoyed some Irish novels recently, very mm. good, I like. And then writes um, the actress, which... Uh, Came out last year, it's very good. John Banville's another Irish author I'm, I'm quite keen on, and, and he's now writing under his own name. Very good detective stories. Uh, so there's one called Snow, which I, I, I just read, which, which again is very good. Um, I'm quite a fan of. Scottish, well, Scottish noir, I suppose Tartan Noir, as it's called, or uh, Scottish detective fiction. And I'm reading at the minute Louise Welsh's uh, The Second Cut, which is a kind of sequel to The Cutting Room, which was one of her early novels. Uh, and that's that's extremely good. I, I, I like Louise Welsh and I, the other great Scottish crime writer that. Um, that I'm keen on is Denise Miner, mm. uh, like all her stuff, really. Uh, and both of them are great on Twitter. They're both great comedians, of great uh, great people to follow on, on Twitter. So that's that's the sort of stuff I'm, I'm reading at the minute. I've got a big Val McDermott novel, 1979, waiting, but mm. uh, I don't know what I'll get around to it. Mm. The other bit of literary fiction I've read recently is... Pat Barker's um, The Trojan Women, uh, mm -hmm. which is a, a sequel to her uh, uh, Silence of the Girls. Um, that's very good, very evocative of 
demons. Mm. Of victimhood and war and peace and, and mm. sex differences and the rest. Um, but I, I'm afraid I don't I don't read an awful lot of nonfiction nowadays. You know, <laughs> that's okay. Maybe I spent a life having to read nonfiction. On that's just, okay. I mean, I I started reading James Joyce recently. <laughs> oh, yeah. The shortest stories. I mean, <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Dubliners. Dubliners, yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh, that's fine. It's when you get to Finnegan Wake or Ulysses that that's these are novels. People get to page twenty five and decide it's not for them. You know. <laughs> um, in terms of films, any films you've been watching recently? No, what, it's been difficult. what kind of genre do you like? I mean, in the film. Ah, it's it's been difficult with with lockdown. I don't know. I used to I used to be big in westerns, but going back a long way, uh, I used to be big in westerns. But I was watching on Netflix uh, the Benedict Cumberbatch. Um, oh, what's it called? The the one that didn't win an Oscar, some Power of the Dog or something. Like yeah, that was. yeah, yeah. And and I was halfway through it and thought. Oh, I'm getting to the age where I don't like harrowing films anymore, and and this is and th this is distressing me. <laughs> I should have had a trigger warning. So <laughs> I think as most westerns or most most good westerns certainly in the golden age of the westerns, which for me was nineteen seventies, with mm. directors like Sam Peck and Pa, um, they were all quite harrowing as well. So maybe my maybe my days for that kind of film are, are past now. You know? But uh, I can't think what else we've, we've seen recently. Oh, like, so okay. Belfast, which takes us back, obviously, to the, the time we were talking about with the, the beginning of the, the troubles in, in Ireland. That, that was quite good. But I'm mm. afraid, afraid the best part of it for me was trying to make sense of um, what's the name's accent, which is called again. Uh, she played the, the mother in... Uh, Mm -hmm. Judy Dench. Judy Dench, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, she had a very, very interesting Irish accent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the secular role. Nice film, but it was very mm -hmm. lightweight. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the film got lots of criticism as well, you know, that, because obviously it was written by, like, done by Kenneth Branagh, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So um, he has got knighthood, so he's like Tsar and all those things. So, he's, so the film has got, you know, kind of, you know, not got into those complexity of the real thing happening. And That's it's, right. it's more about his story and then taking out, you know, so. Yes. The story, it's, kind it's, of positive story. Uh, it's a Coronation Street type uh, community mm -hmm. in, in North Belfast. Mm -hmm. uh, sure people that lived through it have different, different recollections of it. Um, but there were some good perform performances yeah, in there. Yeah. Mm, uh, mm. It, it depends what level of um, mm. of uh, analysis you go for. I mean, the other film I saw recently, well, not recently, it's a while since, so one with Francis McDonough, and oh, I forget, but it, it, was a, it was a big film a couple of years ago. She's um, loses her job, whatever, and she she becomes more or less itinerant in her own motor home and the rest. And she's traveling all round, round to sort of the northern states of, of, of the states. And uh, I think I saw goes that. the community and it, it, it was a, it was a terrific film in, mm. in terms of performance magnificent, but you know, you, you have to say, well, it, it didn't really engage with the issues of what sort of society, what sort of economy allows this kind of thing to happen to mm. middle-aged people and the rest of it. And it was mm. very soft pedal on Amazon, mm. um, presumably because it got access to Amazon for the film, you know, but there was, there was no, Amazon was a kind of benevolent presence in, in, in the storyline. <laughs> So it depends what level you're going to engage okay. in. Right. Thank you so Good. much. And see okay. you soon. Um, yeah. Right. Okay. Bye. Bye now. Votre toast, je 
Señor, Señor, car avec les soldats. 